thanks all for joining us again. Uh, welcome back to A Brief Account. My name is Nira Malde. I'm joined by two of my senior colleagues, uh, Jimmy Rowe and Kelly Barnett from our National Accountants Liability Team. Uh, today, we're going to focus on some of the key issues uh, we see when handling claims against accountants arising out of tax mitigation schemes and planning more generally. Uh, we're not going to be able to cover everything. It's a really complex area, but we're going to hopefully go through some of the common themes that we're seeing. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, just please put them in the questions Q&A box down the bottom and we will pick those up at the end. So I guess the best place to start would be to explain what is tax mitigation. So providing advice on tax is one of those many things that accountants do. It can range from basic tax calculations through to lawful tax planning arrangements for individuals um, and businesses of varying complexities. Um, there are also the much more aggressive tax schemes out there that are likely to be challenged by HMRC. Uh, some of you will know the difference between tax mitigation and tax avoidance as well. But essentially, tax mitigation is a way for individuals or companies to try and mitigate and having to pay more tax than they would have had to. So there are various examples on the next slide. Um, but one simple one would be, uh, for example, an ISA, where you put money in and you avoid having to pay tax on, on the savings interest. Uh, many professional negligence claims involving the aggressive tax schemes have come through because HMRC are taking a really hard line um, and, and looking to try and shut some of them down. I think accountancy practices generally have moved away from touching them largely, probably as as because of bad press uh, and maybe even the uh, negative implications when they're when they're looking to renew and insurers don't really want to go near them. So over to the next slide and here uh, we're going to try and touch on um, R&D tax relief claims specifically um, just because whilst they aren't schemes they are a tax planning arrangement designed to maximize relief. Um, R&D means research and development and it's a corporation tax relief that may reduce a company's tax bill if it can evidence and advise that it's undertaken work to advance projects in science and technology. Um, there are really complex nuances around when companies can claim this um, so it's quite complicated and it's pretty topical for us right now. We've seen a lot of claims come through involving them over the last few years. And you'll see on the slide, that's probably because the applications to HMRC for R&D tax relief really increased over the last, last 10 years. Um, there's a claim I've dealt with recently, actually, for a top accountancy practice. And whilst there are no formal allegations of negligence yet, um, the clients had a real pushback from HMRC um, about the relief and is unwilling to essentially provide it. And our, our insured client has been um, called upon to give evidence and advice in relation to that. Um, so we've been assisting with that, uh, given the potential implications for negligence as well. So moving on to the next slide. Um, the other tax planning arrangements that we've come across are listed, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them in detail. We don't have time today, but they're the ones we are coming across with the claims we're dealing with. Um, there's obviously a number of other things that can impact these schemes politically, socially, economically. Um, and there's a quote that we put on the slide, you know, that shows why they're under such scrutiny, um, given government pledges over the, over the recent years. We've also got the upcoming budget at the end of this month, and that's likely to set out further commentary on changes and support of tax schemes. There's likely to include significant hikes for wealthy individuals relating to, for example, capital gains, IHT, and that's going to encourage individuals to take urgent and potentially um, a aggressive tax measures, uh, planning measures around what, they're, what they own, etc. And some of those are likely to be challenged. So that in itself is likely to lead to further claims in the future. There might also be new reliefs granted, um, we'll find out, but that in itself is likely to generate mistakes by firms as well. So we've seen a number of the a number of claims involving tax mitigation, and Jiv's going to pass over to Jiv shortly to talk about some of the examples that she's come across. But we thought it'd be really useful to talk about some of the common themes that we're seeing along the way. So the first one I wanted to touch upon was duty of care and knowing who your client is. Um, we see a number of claims uh, with question evolves around well who did who did the accountant even act for and who did they owe a duty of care this scenario can obviously apply to a number of professionals and you might be aware of the recent case of um, McLean and Thornhill uh, from last year 
involving a barrister and that case involved a film finance um, tax avoidance scheme specifically so we've all we the cases we've been involved with are probably pretty similar where work and advice has been provided um, by third parties connected to our insured and then that information has then been passed on to the clients um, and then relied upon but then the claim has come in directly to our client. Another common theme that we come across a lot is the uh, the difference between being an advisor or an introducer, which maybe links into the last theme as well that I just mentioned, and often depends on the original remit of the retainer. So we often go to the letter of engagement to see what's there. It's a really fine line between the two, but there is a difference. And Jib's going to talk about that a bit more, but we've acted for insureds. Um, accountant insureds, for example, who've, who've merely introduced their clients to a scheme and didn't necessarily advise upon it. But again, they've been the, the one at the centre of the professional negligence claim. I mean, the same issue has is been considered in case law. Um, you've got the case of Knights and Townsend, where the accountant was found not liable um, for losses arising from failed tax schemes to which they introduced their client as if there was no evidence to suggest it was unreasonable to do so. So handing over to Jeff, what, what kind of issues have you come across? Well, evidence is something that I want to talk about. And by that, I mean oral or documentary evidence, which goes right to the heart of establishing negligence. So whilst these cases can be really technically complicated, and we often do need a tax expert to assist us, you still have to investigate what duties the insured assumed, to who, um, what advice they gave and when. So is there another cause of loss, for example? So I recently had a case involving advice um, which had been given as to whether or not to incorporate a healthcare practice. So aside from analysing the tax advice given and whether that advice was correct, we still had to investigate exactly who said what to who and when. So that was in terms of the information provided by the client about their decision to incorporate and the extent of the oral and written advice which the accountant actually gave. So that was in our case. So often the evidential issues are just as important as identifying and understanding what the tax advice should have been and then the financial consequences of any negligence. Another issue is more specifically around the question of whether the insured was an introducer or an advisor in respect of tax mitigation schemes. And Nir has touched on this already. It's so crucial in tax mitigation cases um, because an introducer will typically owe much less onerous duties than an advisor. Sometimes it can be really clear, and especially if the insured is barely involved, but often it isn't. And you need to interrogate the documentary evidence interview the fianas at the insured, um, just to try to piece together exactly what their role was and the extent to which they ever gave any advice. Sometimes they might start as an introducer and then creep into an advisor role without restricting the retainer, um, which can cause problems. So we had a recent case where the insured, if they'd have been found to have been an advisor, would have been negligent and liable for really significant sums Instead, what we were able to do is paint a really broad evidential picture, which was largely based on oral evidence, actually, um, that they were only introducers and that limited the settlement considerably. So, Nira, what, what are the things do you think we should be looking at um, when we're dealing with tax mitigation? Thanks, Shiv. I think, you know, when we're looking at the claims, say, from a claims handler's perspective or if you're handling these in-house, as it may be, one of the key things to look at is the letter of engagement and what's in that. And that's one of the first things we look at. You know, you want to see what the, what was the scope of works? Um, has there been any brief creep? Um, were, did, did, were any specific deadlines set out? So, for example, for R&D, you usually have two years within which to make a claim. Uh, one thing that we always, always look out for is limits of liability, and that's key. And it's been a really, really useful defence that we've been able to, you know, hang our hat on, really. Um, so even if we've had to hold up our hands and make an admission as to liability, often for a really significant claim, we've been able to say, well, there's a cap in the letter of engagement and that's all we're willing to pay over. So it makes it, it can really help commercially as well in relation to that. I think another good thing to look out for, say again, for example, if you're looking at R&D claims, 
is, is there a record of how the science or the technology was going to be moved forward? Because that's key in terms of being able to obtain the relief. Um, and in the case I'd already talked about today, what we've gone back to look for is, were the technical people involved when the accountant was you know, advising in the first place? Is there a thorough attendance note and a record of what those technical people said about how everything was being advanced? So then it goes without saying that administrative hygiene is is a, is key in these cases. And you've got to hope that your insureds have got good, good files. Not always the case, but you know, it's always quite useful. Um, and that also goes to then helping to see who who dealt with giving the advice in the first place was it someone quite junior were they supervised well who were who were the people the key people involved Jib, any other things you wanted to pick up on well let me turn to a couple of generic issues that we often grapple with at the start of a tax claim so the first is the question of an accountant's own interest conflicts so Typical example of this is where an accountant has advised a client on maybe a tax scheme or an arrangement, um, which is challenged by HMRC, or alternatively, they might have missed a deadline and they can't claim for a relief. So the accountant wants to appeal it and understandably, you know, they want to sort the problem out for their longstanding client. The problem that they have is that they have uh, an own interest in the outcome because an option available to the client is just simply to pursue the firm. Ultimately, that's a decision for the firm rather than insurers. But if in acting, they prejudice the position, there could, of course, be policy consequences. So the st touchstone question we need to ask is set out in I I ICAW guidance, and that's set out on the slide in front of you. So the question is whether the member can give and be seen by a reasonable and informed third party to give objective advice or service. So if, for example, the accountant is saying to the client, you know, don't worry, we'll sort this out for you. But at the same time, they're notifying their professional indemnity insurers of a potential claim. That's usually enough to say that they can't fulfill the test. Interestingly, there are circumstances where it can work too. So, for example, um, we had a case recently where the client was a long-standing client of the insured and, again, they wanted to continue to act for them. Um, liability would be established if the HMRC appeal wasn't successful. And after a review of the papers and with the agreement of insurers, we worked with the insured to deal with the appeal for their client. Um, however, in that case, it's really important um, to note that the insured was very transparent with their client. So they knew that insurers were involved. They knew that they had a potential claim. And fundamentally, the insured was able to confirm, again, importantly, with the agreement of insurers, that they'd indemnify the client and pay the penalties if the appeal was unsuccessful. So that kind of example is quite exceptional. Um, more often than not, the client will need independent advice on an appeal. But I think it illustrates nicely the circumstances where it can work. The second issue is a point on experts. So tax mitigation claims are specialist and they nearly always at some point during the claim require expert input. So we always try to identify and conflict an expert early you can even retain them if you want to and then just pop them on hold. Um, it can happen where you want to retain a specific person, but the other side have secured them first. So it's just best to avoid that early. Nira, we've covered a lot of ground. Where do you think this all brings us to? Thanks, Jib. I think whilst we're really au okay with the structures, um, Tax mitigation is, is really complicated. I mean, we've got our own internal tax lawyers here, so it's it's really good for us in terms of being able to lean into their expertise. But we are seeing more claims against accountants, um, given the increase of reliefs available, as you know, as well as political and economic drivers. I think, though, despite seeing different reliefs um, and different types of tax planning coming through, the key themes legally remain the same, such as duty of care, is someone an advisor or an introducer, you know, own interest conflicts, et cetera. So I think the rules around tax mitigation have changed a lot. They'll continue to do so. 
Uh, we expect claims against accountants to increase a lot, but you know, keeping up with the changes is going to be pretty key. Um, I'll hand over now to Kelly to, to see and pick up any questions we may have had. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who's been busy submitting questions for our Q&A. We'll deal with a few of those live now, and we'll aim to deal with the rest by email afterwards. Neera, um, one for yourself. You mentioned that claims arising out of many of the aggressive tax mitigation schemes have actually come through the system now. Do you think, though, that insurers should be worried about another wave of these claims on the horizon? Mm, I think... <sighs> I think in terms of the actual aggressive tax schemes, I mean, they've got such a bad reputation now. I, I don't know if it's going to be the same as, you know, the last earlier recession around the time I qualified, uh, which was a long time ago. But I don't think it's going to be the same fear that we had back then. And, you know, there was a bit, there was a massive fear back then. And we, we did see a trickle. I, I think most of the claims, they are going, I think we are going to see an increase in claims, but not necessarily with the schemes, but maybe the tax planning around the edge of that a bit more. Um, I think the changings in relation to the planning rather than the aggressive schemes. Yeah, that's where I think it will be. I mean, I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But um, yeah, no, that's my my prediction there. Thank you, um, Neera, for doing some stargazing for us. I think the next one is for Jiv. You talked about accountants taking a decision to continue acting for a client, potentially prejudicing their policy in doing so. How would that actually work in practice? That's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I mean, you know, often a firm of accountants will identify an issue before the client does and they'll notify their insurers and ask for guidance, which, which is great. Um, in terms of an example, um, we, we had a case recently um, where the firm identified it failed to make an application for relief. Um, and that was in respect of some um, complex international income for a high net worth individual and their family. So um, they'd acted for the client for years and th they just wanted to sort this problem out for them. So uh, they, they wanted to act on the appeal um, to HMRC or you know, simply also just possibly pay out the relief themselves. So the problem that we had with that was that the issues were they were actually really complicated and it wasn't as simple as the insured just being able to continue to act. So uh, with the example that I made earlier. So in that case, um, if the insured had continued to act, it could have missed out on various mitigation arguments, which would have increased the value of the claim and caused problems for the defence. So hopefully that illustrates a bit of a practical working example. Thank you. It sounds like that's definitely something to get early advice on, particularly if there's mitigation steps that can be taken. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I think that's actually all we have time for live. Um, and we'll deal with the rest by email, but I'll hand back to um, Neera to close. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I guess just to thank you all for joining us today. Um, please do complete the feedback form, which, which will be on your screens when we sign off. And feel free to include any topics that um, that you want to talk about further. I've, you know, we can see from the live questions that, that, that we haven't got time for now, but we can come back to you separately that there's a bit of an interest in the R&D side of things and practical things. There's definitely things we can pick up there. Um, and if there's anything else, um, just get in touch. So we'll be back really soon with another brief account. Thank you.